Good afternoon, everyone. We are happy to give continuance to this amazing program, this amazing series called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. I remember growing up, we have this interesting, uh, I would say, custom in West Africa. If your mother or whoever is responsible for you cook something you don't like, because you're so loving with your neighbor, you actually get to take a plate of that food and go to your neighbor's house and do a switch. <laughs> so you give them what your mother's cooked and take a plate of what they cook and you bring it home and you eat it. Perhaps you don't like whatever your mother cooked or something like that. So it's an interesting custom in West Africa. So we grow up doing that anytime we don't like something. Friends, I would like to say though, Christ Jesus was the bread of life that the Father as an amazing provider put upon the cross. And once you have come to him, you do not have to change him with any other recipe. That is the perfect recipe. And this is what we have been going through, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It has been sweet and amazing. And we would like to wake, welcome you back for you that's watching online. As we stream live from Wachita Hills College campus, today the message is going to be uh, from Joshua Holly. And the title is Bewitching Spirits. Bewitching Spirits spirits and the lord is willing to do some mighty things so please stick around and prepare your heart as we listen to music before we listen to joshua thank you so much
All right, well, welcome again to our Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar. And today's message is entitled, Bewitching Spirits. And it, it is a solemn topic. Um, it's a very important topic that we have to discuss um, because it's Bible truth. And so I want to pray and ask you to pray for me that I can present this message in the love of Jesus and as graciously as I possibly can. Um, but before we start, um, if you just bow your heads and pray with me. <clears throat> um, Father, once again, Lord, um, we are here to hear truth, Lord. And Father, we need the spirit of truth to come and touch our hearts and reveal these things to us personally, Lord. Father, I pray that you would take away any distraction here, Lord. I pray, Father, that the people that are watching online, Lord, that you would help them be very attentive, Lord, and that you would... Um, just help open up our eyes, Lord. Allow us to see beautiful things in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, we want to learn about what happens when you die. We've entitled it Bewitching Spirits, but we want to learn what, ha- what does the Bible say happens when you die. A very morbid kind of topic, but it's important, friends, and you want to know why the subject is important. It's right here, friends. The Bible says in John 8, verse 32, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. So friends, this topic tonight is intended to make people free, to set people free. People have all types of ideas built up in their mind about what happens when you die, and God wants to set our minds free. He wants to set people free, and the truth can set you free. Do you believe that? what the Bible says. So no matter what topic you discuss, friends, the Bible can set us free. And this topic tonight is going to set people free. And so first I want us to look at a story found in 1 Samuel 28. It's a really interesting story about King Saul. King Saul was the chosen by God. And he was well pleasing to God from a young age. He had done the things that pleased God. He had chose God. But whenever he was made king, he got exalted to a high position and pride took over. And King Saul actually became a very cruel king. There was a st- part of the story, he um, killed a whole group of priests. Um, he was seeking to assassinate David, who was the chosen anointed of God. Saul had this spiraling downfall, and eventually he completely grieved the Holy Spirit away. God would no longer speak to Saul. He would seek after prophets. He would seek um, the Urim and the, th- the Thummim, I think that's how you pronounce it. And God would not speak. He was, God was silent. And we see Saul got desperate, friends. And if you read the story, it says that, then said Saul unto his servants, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. This was a desperate situation here. Because Saul knew that God condemned seeking uh, mediums and and wizards and people that had a familiar spirit. But yet Saul did it anyways. And it's quite an amazing story. Because when you read the story, friends, as Saul went into this medium and had an experience with her, and this apparent medium was able to bring up an apparition, apparently who was imitating the prophet Samuel, Samuel had died several years ago. And you read the story, it's amazing because as this medium was able to bring up the spirit, a spirit that was impersonating Samuel, who was talking like Samuel, who was saying things that Samuel would do, and also gave a most discouraging message to Saul. And it's really interesting because as this spirit was brought up, this spirit mixed a little truth in with some error. And this spirit was actually able to say some things that actually came true. The spirit who was supposedly Samuel told Saul that tomorrow you're going to die and your three sons are going to die. And when you read the story, friends, that's exactly what happened. In 1 Samuel 31, 6, it says, So Saul died and his three sons. So what the spirit said came true, but I got a question for you. Is a witch of the devil able to bring up God's dead prophets. Is that, is, is that logical? You know, God today, friends, he wants us to be intelligent beings. He wants us to think for ourselves and make wise, logical decisions in our beliefs. Can a witch of Satan, does a witch of the devil have power to bring up God's prophets, the dead? That doesn't make any sense, does it? 
But I'm not saying that something didn't happen because this witch was able to do something. Something come, something happened there, friends. But the first question is, was the form that Saul saw actually Samuel, a dead prophet? What do you think? No, because it doesn't make sense. But you know what makes sense? The answer is found in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 22, 22. And he said, I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. So maybe it's that that was a lying spirit. Now that makes sense. You know, because the devil has power. We're not here to exalt the devil, friends. We need to be wise and understand that the devil has power. He has spirits too. And he can go impersonate the dead. He can do some crazy things, some mighty things, friend, friends, that I've actually seen with my own eyes. But the Bible says that they are lying spirits in the mouth of all his prophets. The Bible says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Did you know that devils can work miracles? Did you know that? Because the Bible says it, friends. The devil can work miracles. So we want to look at some questions tonight, friends. And one of them is, do dead people come back to converse with or to haunt the living? Do de- Has anybody ever seen the movie Paranormal? Activity? You ever watch ghost movies or anything like that? I, I, know, I know some people have, and I know a lot of people watching have. You know, I'm not denying some things don't happen. I'm going to tell you a story in just a little bit, friends. But first, we want to see what does the Bible say? Because what, the, the, what does the truth do? The truth sets you free, makes you free. So we want to learn Bible truth today, friends. So can dead people come back to converse with us? Can we talk to dead people? And do they haunt the living The Bible says his sons come to honor him. This is speaking of the grave. When people come to honor their their, whoever is dead, it says, and when he and his sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not, and they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not. So when people go to the graves to visit the graves, and they're brought low with weeping, the dead don't know that. The dead don't know that you're there. The Bible says, the dead know not anything, neither have they any reward. Any reward. The dead don't know anything. You know, when I was 14 years old, my, my grandmother, I was very close to my grandmother. She died. And I remember when she was alive, she didn't have any clue what me and my, my older brother were doing in our life. And we weren't doing anything good. But she didn't know that. But whenever she died, we thought that she went to heaven. That's what we were taught from a young age. And I remember me and my brother were up one night and we were doing things we're not supposed to be doing. We were doing drugs and things like that. And we started getting creeped out, thinking, man, grandma's up there watching us right now. She's up there watching us just destroy our lives. We were thinking when she was alive, she didn't know. But now that she's dead, she's just watching the misery on earth. And friends, that does not make any sense. And has anybody ever seen Judge Judy before? You want to know something? I learned something from her before. You know something she says? She says, if it don't make sense, it's not true. And let me tell you something, I believe that. If it doesn't make sense, it's not true, friends. And it doesn't make sense to think that my grandma was up in heaven watching the suffering of her grandchildren, friends. Praise God for the truth of the Bible. It says, neither have they any more a portion for ever in anything that is done under the sun. It says, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, the Bible says in Psalms 115, 17, the dead praise not the Lord. Psalm 6, 5 says, in death there is no remembrance of thee. The Bible says, speaking of the dead, the dead shall return no more to his house. So what are all these ghost stories that we hear? And again, I'm not denying supernatural activity, friends, at all. Now, I'm going to tell you a story real quick. About five years ago, I moved into a house with my girlfriend. And let me tell you something, that house looked very close to that house right there. It looked almost like that, except the house was painted. But it was a scary, dark house, friends. And let me tell you something, we moved in that, when we moved into that house, we started hearing, as soon as we moved in, there was just an eerie feeling in the house. We began hearing things in the house, like footsteps, the walls would be creaking. We're like, okay, maybe this is just an old house. We're just gonna, we're just gonna, we're just gonna say this is just an old house. My girlfriend worked at a grocery store, and at this grocery store, she worked with a medium that contacted the dead, and she told my girlfriend that there was an old lady that was still in our house. And let me tell you something. One night, friends, 
Me and my girlfriend are in the living room. And out of nowhere, in our kitchen, cabinets started being slammed open and shut. Somebody was in the kitchen taking the stove, slamming the stove open, slamming the stove shut. I grabbed my weapon and ran to the kitchen. When I ran to that kitchen, you know what happened? I heard somebody run from the kitchen to the bathroom. And when I was in the kitchen, the bathroom, all the cabinets in the bathroom started being slammed shut. The toilet seat was slamming the toilet sheet, the, to the toilet seat. My girlfriend came to the kitchen with me. We ran to the bathroom and we heard this demon in our home run from our bathroom back to our kitchen and start slamming cabinets, slamming our stove. There was nobody in our house, friends. There was, nobody, there was, there was not a person that was there and it wasn't a dead person either, friends. But me and my girlfriend packed our stuff real quick, a backpack, and we left the house, and we went and slept in a Walmart parking lot that night. Scared. We eventually went back, and, and we didn't live in the house for very much longer, friends. But the question is, is, was that a dead person, or was that a lying spirit trying to torment us? I know it's real. And again, I'm not, I know it's real, friends. I've seen other things, friends, that I'm not even going to tell you about, friends. I've seen some supernatural things, friends. But they are devils. And lying spirits, friends. And God wants to teach us the truth. He wants to set us free. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about those things. We can, we can be comforted. We can walk through a graveyard in the middle of the night and not be scared, friends, because those dead people are dead. They're in the grave, friends. So according to the Bible, according to the book of Revelation, who has the keys of death? Is it the witch in Endor? Is it these mediums, these sorcerers? And again, I, I'm, try, I'm really trying to do my best be very sensitive in this topic and to present it graciously because I know there's a lot of people that are deceived by this. Close friends of mine who talk to the dead, seen it, close friends, but God wants to set them free. God wants us to know the truth. So according to the book of Revelation, who has the keys of death? The Bible says, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. So who has the keys of hell and death? Not the witch at Endor. Jesus. Jesus has the keys of death, friends. Only Jesus. So how did God make man in the beginning? This is an important, important um, question that we need to answer today, friends, because to understand um, what happens when you die, to understand these things, we need to look at what happened at the beginning when God made man. And the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. So God made man out of the dust of the ground, right? And he was just a lump of clay. And then God did what? He breathed into his nostril. He breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living being. He became a living soul. So we need to understand what a soul is, friends, because in the Bible, God didn't like put this little soul inside of Adam. There's not like some type of entity that's inside of us that like goes straight to heaven or goes straight to hell. The Bible says that God breathed into his, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Does that make sense? So you, you, you can't have one without the other. So it's, it's, it's man mixed with the breath of life makes a soul. So what happens at death? The Bible says, Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So it's almost like the opposite thing happens at death that happened at creation. So God created man, lump of clay, breathed into him the breath of life, became a living soul. When man dies, goes back to dust, and the Spirit goes back to God who gave it. But we need to understand what that means, the Spirit, friends. That's not saying some conscious entity goes back to God. It's saying the breath of life that God gave. You know, every living thing here breathes air. The plants, the insect, there's something powerful about breath, about God's breath that gives life. God's breath, friend, gives life. It says in Job 27.3, it says, All the while the breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So what is that talking about? Is that like talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in my nostrils? It's not, is it? No, it's talking about the breath of life. 
So when you die, you simply, the breath simply goes back to God who gave it. Does that make sense? It's like this computer right here. If I unplug the computer, the electricity goes back to the power plant and the computer dies. So when a man dies, the electricity from God goes back to God. Does that make sense? God wants us to understand these things, friends. And so where do the dead go when they die? Where do the dead go? The Bible says, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. John 5, 28 and 29 says, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. So the Bible says when you die, you go to the grave. You're in the grave. Does that make sense? There's, no resur- there's not been a resurrection yet. There hasn't been a judgment yet. It's not till the judgment that a resurrection takes place. So whenever you die, you simply go to the grave and you rest in Jesus until that day that Jesus comes back. Everybody with me? Okay, amen. So our next question is, buzzing, but isn't it true that the soul is immortal and that only the body dies? And this is what everybody thinks. This is what I was raised up to believe. But again, friends, we want to just let the Bible speak for itself. The Bible is powerful, friends. The Bible has, can say it a lot better than I can do, friends. So what does the Bible have to say about the soul being immortal? The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know, the very first lie that's recorded in the Bible, the devil told Adam and Eve that if they ate that fruit, that they would not surely die. But the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says, in 1 Timothy 6, 15, the Lord, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Jesus is the only one that has immortality, friends. And he's offering it to us. Those that want to believe in him and trust him, he's offering us immortality, friends. But it's not given to you at birth. You're not born with immortality. It's a gift that God is seeking to give all those that will trust and believe in him. So next question is, when will the righteous be given immortality? Beautiful promise, friends. The Bible says we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And this mortal must put on immortality. So there's nobody with immortality right now. It's only when Jesus comes that immortality is offered. It's not now. It's when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, friends, he's offering us immortality. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a promise. I don't know if any of you have ever been separated from a loved one for death, from death, but this should bring us hope and comfort right here, knowing that when Jesus comes back, friends, that he's going to raise those dead people up. And it's true. It's going to happen. He's given us plenty of evidence to believe his word. Next question is, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? The Bible says um, in the story of Lazarus, it says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. And the disciples didn't understand what he's saying right there. The disciples are like, well, if he sleeps, he'll be okay. So Jesus said, our friend is dead. He's dead. The Bible refers to death as a sleep. The Bible says, Them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the Bible says that when you die, you go to the grave and you sleep. But hopefully you're sleeping in Jesus. But regardless, friends, the dead are dead. And this truth is meant to bring peace to us and comfort. You know, I'll tell you, friends, my father... My father passed away 10 years ago, and he was not a Christian man. He took his own life. You know, but learning this truth right here has brought so much comfort to me. You know, my dad, he lived a miserable life. He did. He was in so much pain his whole life. He lived on pain pills. But, you know, now I get comfort knowing that my father is resting in the grave. He's sleeping. He's not somewhere. He's not in eternal torment right now. And he's not up in heaven looking down on the sorrows of this world. My father is resting peacefully. No more pain. He's in the grave. And that's, that's what this truth is supposed to do, friends, to bring us peace and comfort and hope. That's what God's word does, friends. No matter what you're going through in life, friends, God's word, 
God's word is meant to bring us peace, friends. Psalms 13, verse 3 says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, and lighten my eyes to sleep the sleep of death. The Bible continually refers to death as a sleep, friends. So learning all these things, friends, since wizards, witches, and psychics cannot contact the dead, who are they contacting? Who are they contacting? The Bible says in Revelation 16, 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. So next question is, why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? Why does Satan go through all this to try to, to, try to make us believe that the dead are alive? The Bible says, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall so, show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect but he says behold i've told you beforehand the devil's trying to deceive us friends you know what would you think if you saw a dead family member and they started tell, trying to tell you heresy about the bible what would you think friends what would you think if you saw if you saw someone you knew was dead would you listen to them because let me tell you something this isn't just talking about the few this stuff is happening now it's happening today, friends. The dead are appearing all over the place, friends. And they're talking to people and communicating things with people. We need to know where the dead are, friends. They are in the grave. They are sleeping. That is not the dead, friends. It's not the dead. And Jesus says, behold, I have told you before. God wants to open up our eyes, friends. Next question is, how effective will Satan's use of these evil spirits be in the last days and you know i pray i pray there's some people if not here that are watching online that have been dabbling in some of these things because god wants to show you what's really going on so that you will know that those are not the dead and so you can know that you're dabbling with fallen angels friends because the bible says by thy sorcery speaking of the devil were all nations deceived the Bible says in Revelation 18, verse 2, Babylon the great is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit. Revelation 12, 9 says, That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth how much of the world? All the world. We need to be wide awake today, friends, and not being caught up in these deceptions and understand the Bible and the truth of the Bible, friends. So next question is, how does God regard these miracles by evil angels? And I want to tell you, friends, these next, this question right here and these next few slides, I was this close to taking out of my presentation. And I was, as I was taking them out of my presentation, God so heavily said, no, you preach the truth. Preach the truth. Preach the truth. And that's what God has called me to do, friends. The Bible says, a man also or woman that is a wizard shall be what surely put to death you know i'm not suggesting that we that we go back to the dark ages and that we begin killing these people but it's important we see how serious god is about these things he says put them to death that's serious isn't it god's not playing friends and the devil's not playing either the devil's you know, you know the devil is playing he's playing the game of life with you and me the Bible says, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, verse 11, to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, for the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, unclean, uncleanliness, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. Revelations 21.8, it says, Sorcerers shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God is giving us a warning, friends. A warning. Because the truth is what makes you free. And friends, this, friends, this is the truth. And we need to understand these things. And maybe, like I said, I, I know people that dabble around with this stuff. I know them back home. And they've had real experiences with supernatural beings. 
I remember I tried to talk to one one time, and they got so scared, they, they didn't want to talk to me. But I'm praying today that God would open up their eyes and allow them to see that it is true. They are speaking to somebody, but they need to know it's the devil and his angels. God is trying to call us out of darkness, friends, giving us a solemn warning today, a solemn warning. So the last question, friends, before we come to a close, is what glorious power does God offer his people? What is it that God is offering us today, friends, through his truth? The Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This is what Jesus is offering us today, friends. He's offering us immortality. He's offering us the power of his resurrection that we might live forever. It says that I may know him. The truth, friends, as it's found in Jesus, no matter how serious it is, no matter how solemn the message is, friend, Jesus gives us truth to bring us out of darkness, bring us out of error, and give us the opportunity to have eternal life. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just and simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him, or endure. Is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that the Amen. Amen. So there is nothing sweeter than trusting in Jesus. Nothing. And he's proved himself to us. He's given us his word, and he has proven himself to us, friends. There's nothing better than trusting in him. And these topics, friends, again, are given because the truth is what makes us free, friends. Jesus today, friends, doesn't tell us these things to scare us. He gives us these things to have our eyes open and be wise people in these last days. Because Jesus is offering us eternal life. Eternal life. Live forever. Never die. How many of you would like to have eternal life? Yeah? Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word, Lord. Um, this truth tonight, the Father, has, has impacted my life so gratefully, so, so amazing, Lord. 
I used to be so fearful, Lord. But through this message, Lord, the fear has been lifted off. And my eyes have been opened, Lord. And I pray that that same experience could be upon all of us, Lord. That you could open our eyes. Allow us to behold truth as it's found in Jesus and found in your word. And I pray that fear would depart out of our lives forever, Lord, concerning this topic of, of what happens when we die. And Father, again, we just thank you, Lord. Pray that um, you accept all, all of us today, Father, and pray that you continue to draw close to us. And again, Father, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. So seven o'clock, we have another amazing um, sermon by Mark Kennedy. We're going to be looking at the final firestorm. So don't miss that. Seven o'clock. And it's going to be amazing. We're so pleased you could join us for this special event here at Washington Hills College and Academy. If you've enjoyed the programs just as much as I did, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you want to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description box below. Thank you so much for joining us. May God richly bless you.